Jeremiah 32, we will read verses 1 to 15. Jeremiah 32, let's listen to God's word. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. And Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah. For Zedekiah king of Judah had imprisoned him, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving the city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. Zedekiah king of Judah shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And he shall take Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall remain until I visit him, declares the Lord. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. So this is the reason why Jeremiah was imprisoned, because he said these things. We come to verse 6. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord. And he said to me, Buy my field that is at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Barak, the son of Neriah, the son of Maseah, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. I charged Barak in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware vessel, that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. So far, our scripture reading. So the <clears throat> text for the sermon is uh, the passage that we just read already. So I won't read it again. And we can go straight to the Proclamation of God's Word. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, every sermon these days has to start with something about the coronavirus. I understand, so I will do that too. The coronavirus has affected many of aspects of our life, including the economy. There were reports that the sale of houses and property in Canada went down by about 50% as compared to last year. Understandably so. In times of uncertainty, people are cautious. Some people might take chances, hoping to get a good deal. But I think most people prefer to wait and see what will happen to the economy, the markets, before they spend big money on a property. Now, try to imagine the situation in Jerusalem that is described in Jeremiah 32. The country was occupied by the Babylonian army. The whole country had been taken. Uh, many people had fled to Jerusalem. And the city itself was now under siege. 
So the enemy was all around the city, and it looked like the end was in sight. And think about the effect on the real estate market. Would anyone be interested in buying a property somewhere in the country at this point in time? Would anyone want to buy a cottage up north if that cottage was in occupied territory? Exactly at this point in time, the prophet Jeremiah gets into the real estate market. At the Lord's command, he buys a field. It's a strange deal. So let's see what happened and what the message is for us today. Jeremiah buys a field. Is it a dumb deal or is it a great investment? That's the question. In order to understand what's going on, I need to tell you a little bit more about the situation or three things I want to mention. First, in verse 1, we read that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in the 10th year of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. It was the year 588 before Christ, if you want to know. And Jerusalem fell in 586. So this happened shortly before Jerusalem was going to fall. Verse 2, we read, At that time the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. So as I said already, the king of Babylon, his army had already taken all of the country. The only thing that was left was Jerusalem itself. The kingdom of Judah was on its last legs. Within a year, the city will be taken and destroyed by the army of the king of Babylon, the temple included. How did it come to this? That's a long story. I'm not going to tell that story, but you know, it was because of the disobedience of God's people. Generation after generation, they had ignored the Lord. They served idols, refused to repent from their evil ways. The Lord had sent many prophets like Jeremiah to call them to repentance, but they did not listen. And now it has come to the end. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, and many of its people are going to be taken into exile. We could have an application here about judgment for sin. I'm not going to do that. Many chapters have talked about sin and judgment. There's something else for this morning. The second thing we need to remember by way of background is mentioned in verse 2 as well. Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah. And the reason is mentioned as well. Jeremiah had prophesied or preached this message. It's no use to try and defend the city because the Lord has given this city into the hands of the king of Babylon. It would be much better for us if we just accepted this and then maybe we will save some lives and maybe the temple can be saved. Um, the king didn't like that. The king's advisors didn't like that. They were still hoping that Egypt might come to the rescue. So they considered Jeremiah to be the wrong voice at the wrong time, and Jeremiah was arrested. We might say that Jeremiah was a political prisoner. He was seen as a traitor, someone who undermined the morale of the people. If only the king and his advisors had listened to Jeremiah and believed his message. If only they had repented and returned to the Lord history might have unfolded differently because the Lord is merciful. And if they had listened carefully, they would know that Jer Jeremiah did not just announce judgment. Jeremiah said, yes, there will be judgment. We are going into exile, but there is a future for God's people. You can read about it, the previous chapter, chapter 31. God has said that I'm going to make a new covenant. After this judgment, there will be a new beginning, a new covenant. And he had said, there is hope for your future. 31 verse 17. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is reward for your work, declares the Lord. And they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. 
Your children shall come back to their country. So there was a beautiful promise as well. And Jeremiah's message had been, we need to accept the punishment that is coming our way. But the Lord is gracious and merciful. He will give us a new beginning afterwards. And again, we say, too bad the king did not accept this message. What might have happened if the king and his people had repented and turned to the Lord? For sure, the Lord would have been merciful. But the way things stand for now, God's people remain stubborn. The king doesn't want to listen. His advisors don't want to listen. God's prophet is imprisoned and Jerusalem is about to fall. The third thing, by way of background, something about Jeremiah's personal life. You see, Jeremiah, as many prophets, had to speak the word of God, but he was also called to be an illustration, often, of the word that he was preaching. Now, Jeremiah was a single man. He was a, a bachelor. He was already in his 50s or 60s, probably. And that was not by choice. It was the Lord's command. You can read it in chapter 16 of Jeremiah, where it says, The word of the Lord came to me, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons and daughters in this place. So Jeremiah was not allowed to marry. He was not allowed to have children. Why not? The Lord had explained that to Jeremiah. I want this to be a message to my people that in this place, Children shall perish by the sword and by famine and by deadly pestilence. This is no longer a place to have children, Jerusalem. So Jeremiah was called to, to live that out, to show that. He was not just to speak God's, God's message, but also to illustrate the message with his life. So you can imagine when someone asked Jeremiah, Hey, Jeremiah, why don't you marry a woman and start a family? He would say, no, the Lord has commanded me not to marry and not to have children because in this city, children have no future. Jerusalem has become a place where children will perish. Okay, that's all just background now. That's the situation. Try to imagine this. Jeremiah, this man, this prophet of the Lord, a man in his 60s, doesn't have a wife, doesn't have children imprisoned in the city of Jerusalem, and the city of Jer Jerusalem itself is besieged by the Babylonian army. That's the situation. And now something remarkable happens. One of Jeremiah's relatives comes to see him in prison. It is his cousin, Hanamel. They know each other. They grew up together in the little town of Anathoth, which is uh, just north of Jerusalem, about five kilometers and cousin Hanamel comes with a request. Jeremiah, please buy my field that is in Anathoth, you know, back home. For the right of inheritance is yours, and the redemption is yours. What do we make of this request? Well, obviously, cousin Hanamel needs money. We don't know why, but we can speculate that he's in Jerusalem. With his family, he needs to buy food every day. Prices are going up, probably. Perhaps he has to pay rent. And now he's run out of money. So Hanamel thinks, I need to find a solution here. And I have a field in Anathoth. If I could sell that field to someone, then at least I have money. But the big question is, who is going to buy that field in the current situation? It's in occupied territory territory. It has no market value. And if I sell it for a bargain price, that's not helpful either. So Hanamel thinks of cousin Jeremiah, the prophet. Maybe he thinks oh, he's, a, he's a religious man. He doesn't understand business. Maybe, he, like many of us ministers, we don't understand business. So maybe I'll, I'll talk to Jeremiah. Maybe he will give me some good money for my field. That would solve my problem. Hanamel uses a clever argument to convince Jeremiah. It sounds really pious. Jeremiah, the right of inheritance is yours, and the redemption is yours. 
Now, you may be familiar with a law in Israel about the year of Jubilee and about the role of the kinsman redeemer. Some big words. Leviticus 25. There was a law in Israel that land cannot be sold permanently. They had a kind of a lease system which the Lord had instituted for them. You could sell a piece of land, but if it was sold, it had to go back to the original owner in the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years was the year of Jubilee. So whatever land had been sold to someone else, it had to come back to the original owners. Very good system. And if the original owner was not able to buy the land from the person who, who owned it by then, then a close relative should help him and give that person the money he was entitled to. And that relative who was helping was, was called the kinsman redeemer. Now, to make a long story short, what Hannibal is suggesting is this. Jeremiah, you know that the Lord wants land to stay in the families. I need money. I am poor. I'm run out of my money. I need to sell this piece of land, and I do not want to sell it to a stranger. Why don't you act as our kinsman redeemer? Buy the field from me. At least, then the property stays in the family. Now, Hannibal is clever, and I would suggest he's also a little bit sneaky. He realizes that the real estate value of this field has plummeted, but he's hoping that cousin Jeremiah will be willing to buy the field from him for a good price. He also realizes that since Jeremiah does not have children, if Jeremiah dies, the field will come back to the family anyway. So he cannot lose. And in order to get Jeremiah to do it, Hanamel uses a pious-sounding argument. You are my closest relative. You are our kinsman redeemer. Now, what does this proposal look like from Jeremiah's perspective? Well, it's not attractive at all. First, the field is an occupied territory. It has no market value. You can't do anything with it. Second, Jeremiah is already in his 60s, and he will probably not be able to use the field himself. And third, in the current situation, it's better to have cash than to have property. Jeremiah should rather hang on to any cash he might have because he, he might need it when the city falls into the hands of the Babylonians. So it makes no sense at all for Jeremiah to buy this field. People would think he's crazy if he does it. And it would be very understandable if Jeremiah said, sorry, cousin, you know, I need to hang on to my retirement savings for now. Maybe there is someone else who can help you. And yet we read in verse 9, and I bought the field at Anathot from Hanamel, my cousin, and I weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. It doesn't sound like Jeremiah tried to negotiate a better price. He simply paid Hanamel what he wanted. 17 shekels of silver. Maybe you're asking, what, what does that mean? Is that a lot? Is that not so much? It's actually hard to know. Um, as far as I can tell, it's not a lot of money, but it's not a bargain. Uh, one source that I read about it said that 17 shekels of silver, that's about the, um, the wages of an unskilled laborer for one and a half year. So if you can figure that out, let's say, for argument's sake, in our today's economy, it would be $100,000, okay? That's what Jeremiah paid to cousin Hanamel. So, Jeremiah doesn't argue about the price, but then he makes a big show about the transaction as such. He gets everybody who is there to come and, and be there and be a witness to what's happening. He signs the deed, he seals it, he makes a copy, 
So one, one, one copy is the official one that will be sealed, and then there is an open copy so that people can always read what is inside. And then he, get, he weighs out the money publicly so that everyone, everyone can see it. And then he tells his secretary, his assistant, Barak, to put the two copies in an earthenware vessel that they may last for a long time. He definitely wants everyone to see what he's doing here. So now the question is, why did Jeremiah buy the field from Hanamel if there were all kinds of reasons not to do it? And why did he make such a public spectacle, spectacle of it? Well, it was below, because the Lord had told him to do it. The Lord had told Jeremiah, verse 6, ahead of time, Behold, your cousin Hanamel will come to you and say, buy my field. That is an anathot for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. So when Hanamel came indeed with his request, Jeremiah knew that this was the word of the Lord. From a business perspective, it did not make sense. But Jeremiah had to do it. He had to be obedient to the Lord's command. And Jeremiah also understood why the Lord wanted him to do this. And he explained it to all those who were witnessing the transaction. Verse 15, the last verse of our text. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be sold and bought in this land. So Jeremiah knew that this purchase was supposed to send a message to God's people. They knew that Jeremiah had always been saying, there is judgment coming. City is going to be destroyed. We are going to be taken into exile. But now, this is added. The people of Jerusalem were to hear the remarkable news that the same prophet had bought a piece of land for his family. A piece of land, not because it had any value at the moment, but because one day, again, land will be sold and bought in Israel. So it was as if the prophet was saying, from a short-term perspective, this doesn't make sense. It's a dumb deal. But from the long-term perspective, this is a great investment. Brothers and sisters, that's the story. The story of Jeremiah buying a field of his cousin. And now we ought to ask, what is the message for us today? I'm sure you will want to know. Why, why should we know this? Why is this in, in the Word of God? Is this a lesson about how to get into the real estate market? Probably not. Is this a message? Is the message going to be this morning that I, I have to tell you, well, use your retirement money and buy a, a piece of property in Israel? I'm not going to say that. That's not the application. Maybe it is a good investment, I don't know. But it's not what this passage is all about. I'm going to suggest that there are three aspects in application for us today. Three aspects. We discover the first aspect when we consider that Jeremiah was called upon to act as a servant of the Lord and that he was definitely expected to make a sacrifice for the sake of God's people. Make no mistake. To shell out 17 shekels of silver was a real sacrifice for Jeremiah. He basically had to give up his retirement security. And it's actually nice, interesting, or even beautiful if you read the rest of the chapter. We didn't, I didn't do that because it would be too long. Maybe you can do it at home. If you read the rest of the chapter, you will see that Jeremiah had what we might call buyer's remorse. You know that word? Buyer's remorse. You bought something and then afterwards you think, oh, I wonder if I did the right thing. If you read the rest of the chapter, you will see that Jeremiah went home and he prayed to the Lord because he didn't understand. And his prayer is basically this, Lord, you have told me that I should prophesy that the city is going to fall and everybody is going to be taken away. And now you wanted me to buy this field? As if Jeremiah was saying, Lord, 
I don't understand it. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And then there is that beautiful answer of the Lord. You can also read it in this, the rest of the chapter. The Lord says, yes, it is the right thing. Because I will again gather my people from all the countries to which I have sent them. I will bring them back to this place. And I will make them dwell in safety. And they shall be my people. And I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. That's the end of the chapter, verse uh, 42 to 44. Now, when we think this through, we understand that one day, Jeremiah's nephews, maybe the second or third generation after him, they would be the ones to benefit from Jeremiah's investment. Because they would be able to come back from Babylon after 70 years and take possession of this field. In Anathoth, the deed of purchase is there, belongs to the family. So Jeremiah's nephews are going to be the beneficiaries. Jeremiah himself, no, he had to make a personal sacrifice. And I think this reminds us of the greater servant of the Lord, the one who made a greater sacrifice for all God's children, you and me included, our kinsman redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, the Apostle Paul says, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty many might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8. Jeremiah had to sacrifice his retirement savings. The Lord Jesus was expected to bring a much greater sacrifice, as you know. He gave his life as a ransom for many. So this is the first aspect of the story. Jeremiah's sacrifice points to the greater sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ for us. And that should drive us to, to praise him. Worthy is the lamb to receive honor and glory. The second aspect of the message this morning is that Jeremiah's purchase of the field was a great investment indeed. Again, think about it from the perspective of Jeremiah's nephews and their family 70 years later. When they came back from exile, there was this piece of land waiting for them. They could just take possession of it, start to work it, and enjoy the blessings from the Lord. And it's not hard to imagine how the conversations went among them. I'm so thankful that Uncle Jeremiah bought this field for us. Man, at the time it seemed like it was a dumb deal. But look, today, it turns out to be a great investment for all of us. Once again, brothers and sisters, draw a line to the greater servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Consider his purchase and what it means for us. Like Jeremiah, the Lord Jesus was a single man. He did not have children of his own. And yet, as we read in Hebrews 2, he brought many sons to glory. In the same chapter, we also read the prophecy of Isaiah 8 that is quoted, Behold, I and the children the Lord has given me. So that's how the Lord Jesus looked at it. With his purchase, with his blood, he bought something for his brothers and sisters, you and me. He considers us to be his brothers and sisters. And what did he do for us? The Apostle Peter writes, With his precious blood, he gave us an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last day. Think about that. Just like Jeremiah's relatives enjoyed the fruits of his investment, so we and, and all who believe in Jesus Christ will enjoy the fruits of his investment. We have an inheritance kept for us in heaven. And like in Jeremiah's time, yes, there will have to be a judgment first. But then that piece of land is going, going to be ours, so, ours, so to speak. It's waiting for us. 
So that's the second aspect of the message. Jeremiah's purchase turned out to be a great investment because it points to the greater investment by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that calls for faith in God's promises. Just like Abraham and all the believers, we are called to look forward to the better country, the city with foundations. And maybe we have doubts sometimes. Is it all worth it? Just like Jeremiah had doubts. But that's the promise. And just like Jeremiah, his investments turn out to be a great investment. So you can be sure that the investment of Jesus Christ, that inheritance, is a great investment. So, even as we live in this world, brothers and sisters, living our lives focused on whatever we are called to do, we are also called to be heavenly minded and have it in mind that yes, there is that inheritance waiting for us. So we come to the final, third and final aspect of the message. Knowing that Jesus Christ has purchased for us a dwelling place on the new earth, we have to learn to adapt our investment strategies accordingly. In fact, Jesus Christ, our Lord, needs to tell us what we have to do with our money, with our possessions, with everything. Now, Christ never said, everyone who follows me should buy a field in Israel. He didn't say that. But he did say, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Christ never said something like, everyone who follows me should give away his retirement savings. He didn't say that. But he did say, make friends for yourselves by means of your money so that they may receive you in the heavenly dwellings. So the message this morning is not in the first place about selling or buying properties, but about learning to view our whole life in the light of the fact that Christ has purchased an inheritance for us. That's what he did. That's his promise. It's waiting for us. And if you look to learn at things from that perspective, your investment strategy is going to change. Because what used to feel like a sensible investment now feels like you're wasting your money. And what used to feel like I'm making a sacrifice now feels like a great investment. And this, this becomes very practical. Consider your tithes and offerings. It's part of worshiping the Lord. It's part of believing what He promises. The Lord expects us to support His church and kingdom with financial con contributions. And just like Jeremiah had to take money from his retirement savings to invest in the future of God's people, so we are called to give to the Lord, to give to His church, to invest in the future of God's people, God's children. Think of Christian education. And to give to the poor. Now, if you don't believe God's promises, it will feel like money going down the drain. But if you believe it, it will feel like this money is really well spent. That's hard, eh? It's not easy to change your, your thought patterns like that. It all depends on, do you believe the promises of, of the Lord? Consider the way we use our time, our opportunities. The Lord calls us to worship Him. On Sundays, we gather for worship. Here you are. During the week, we gather for worship in family, worship or private devotions. From a worldly perspective, people will say, that's just crazy. Why would you spend all that time reading the Bible, praying, singing, all these meetings, you lose your whole Sunday? That's just stupid. But Jesus says that is time really well spent. You are making investments in the heavenly country. Consider all the activities we do as, as, as believers, visiting the sick, visiting the elderly, visiting lonely people perhaps. Think of the work of the elders in the church. 
doing home visits, checking in with God's people, encouraging, admonishing as needed. That's a lot of, invest that's a lot of time and energy invested, and sometimes sleepless nights as well. Think of the work of the deacons who are trying to help the poor and comforting those who are lonely and suffering. I just heard this morning that you're getting new elders again and, and deacons. Think of all the, el the elders that are outgoing. All the time that they spent on this work and think of the new elders and the deacons. That's going to be a sacrifice. Although it's also beautiful, but it is a sacrifice. The world will say you're just wasting your time. You could do something else. You could take a course. You could whatever. But from the perspective of faith and from the perspective of Christ's promises, this is uh, time and energy really well spent. It's a great investment. It has abiding value. So that's the third aspect of the message. As we follow Jesus Christ our Lord, we learn, we are called to adopt a greater vision for investment. Not a short-term, this life kind of investment, but a broader vision, a larger vision. And let's learn to invest in the church of the Lord, the kingdom of God. I sincerely hope that that is your vision too. So, in conclusion, as you go from here, take some time to consider Jeremiah's deal, his purchase. And then consider the investments of Jesus Christ our Lord, the sacrifice that he made, and the inheritance that he bought for us, that's waiting for us. Do you trust his vision? His promise? I really hope so. Because just like Jeremiah's purchase turned out to be a great investment for his family, for his people, so our investments in the church of Christ and in the kingdom of God will turn out to be great investments as well. Amen.